Hello, Warfare folks. Welcome to the third and final episode of this unit, Trireme Tactics. So we're going to start with a definitely not and work our way from implausible to more plausible. Uh, I promised I wouldn't, but we're going to talk again a little bit about 300 Part 2, in which... Uh, Themistocles here has pulled a horse out of the bowels of his trireme. Where was the horse? Was it down where the mast goes? Like, was it clomping around in the middle of all of these people rowing? Like, no, no, you use another kind of ship for carrying horses. Good, good, good. But then also, you cannot ride a horse from a uh, cataphract decking to cataphract decking like a motorcycle or something. First of all, every time the horse jumps down onto the next ship, the ship is going to bob and weave. You're going to capsize a ship. The horse is going to nope out of this situation because horses are not motorcycles. They're smart. They know a bad idea when they see one. Also, you can't jump this far on a horse to say nothing of a horse on fire. Yes? If your horse is on fire, you can't ride it like a motorcycle from ship to ship to ship just to murder Artemisia of Halicarnassus. This is not how any of this works. Also, Artemisia lives and she's so much cooler than she is in that book. So this gives you an idea, though, of the scope of the problem. Uh, our own version of heroic nudity here is uh, doing us a disservice in that we don't really have a firm sense of what the physics of naval combat are, more or less, because generally we don't go to war on sea. Not all of us have been on ships. Modern ships are very different from ancient ships, and furthermore, modern warships are very different from ancient warships. So let's unpack this a bit. How would this would have worked? How do you attack someone effectively? with a trireme. What are the goals of a naval battle? How do you know that you've won? How do you know that you've lost? What is the, um, yeah, what are the rules of engagement? They never involve a horse, just, just unless you're like transporting a horse somewhere. Just, this is so stupid, guys. It's so stupid. It burns my brain. Okay, moving on. So here's something that's only slightly less stupid, although a little less silly looking. Here we have an artist's best guess as to what the Battle of Salamis would have looked like. And it's, it's very exciting. Things are breaking. There's so many ships. They're all smushed together. On the surface, okay, we do know that the problem with the Battle of Salamis is that there wasn't room to maneuver, especially for the Persian fleet. They were just too big. They got stuck in the straits, and then that was it, essentially. But beyond that, our artist has made some guesses about how one would go about moving from the stage where you ram a ship to where you board and finally defeat the ship, because running your ship into somebody else's ship, okay, on paper, this sounds straightforward enough, but think about it for a minute. If you T-bone somebody else's ship, say you're going at a right angle, and your ram just goes like straight into the side of the ship, you've made a hole, and certainly it is going to cause some breakage further down those boards, but with mortars and tenon joints, that damage is limited. You don't have the same kind of catastrophic failures that you do in a clinker built over overlap ship. Furthermore, you have now stuck your own ship's nose right into the middle of the ship you just rammed. And if you go too far in, you're going to be stuck. You cannot maneuver when you have somebody else's dead hulking ship stuck on your ship nose. This is not a good end game. So the goal of ramming can't be T-boning other ships. That's not quite there. The next thing that's a bit problematic about this, and it, I will give them some credit, they're not directly T-boning, they're kind of coming at an angle, which is better, right? So we're sort of intersecting, so it's not as stupid as I made out, but it's a little stupid. Then you'll notice the Marines are sort of boiling up out of the mast hole, 
here, like, there's, there's this dude coming up here, there are like five guys, and they've all got their hoplite shields, so far so good. We do know that Greek marines were essentially hoplites who'd been stuck on a ship. They tended to wear less armor, again, not naked, but less armor, because if you fell in the sea, you would drown, and weirdly, Literary evidence suggests that ancient Greek sailors couldn't swim very well. This seems to have been in part felt to be a mercy, because if you could swim, you would be flail about longer before you met your inevitable end. I think that's kind of messed up, but also the Mediterranean was shark infested during this period, so... Yeah, and not just shark infested, great white sharks in the Mediterranean. Yep, there are still some great white sharks in the Mediterranean even today, but back then it was an issue. Dolphin attacks were also a thing. At any rate, your lifespan is going to be limited if you fall into the water. And you're going to need to get off your armor very quickly. Another thing about helmets in warfare, you, if you remember the artistic evidence, the marines we're looking at seemed to not be wearing helmets uh, again these were venetian marines so you know the the period's a little sketchy but that's likely accurate although the sea peoples yes they were wearing helmets but they were off, often helmet types that could be removed quickly they had like a basic chin strap that you could just this is important because if you're wearing a helmet when you fall off the top of a ship decking, this fall from a height into the water, the water creates drag on the helmet that can snap your neck. This was a problem in naval warfare in the pre-modern period, particularly World War I. A lot of sailors wearing helmets fell into the water and broke their necks in World War I. So just be careful when you're wearing a helmet around a large drop at sea and don't forget that water drag is not an insignificant thing that you're you've got to account for in your battle physics okay so the, the helmets maybe they'd be wearing helmets just because they're archers you may want to protect your head but that's questionable the shields however that's fine the spears that's attestable but there aren't a lot of marines on the ship and if you look, there isn't a railing for them to hang on to, which is consistent with the Lenormand relief, that didn't include railing on the sides either. But you would have had to have some kind of a rope hold on the decking. In fact, this is something that 300 part three, the flaming dumpster fire of a movie actually does get kind of right. Because when you ram another ship, physics is going to ensue, yeah? You are going to have a rapid stop, and then you are going to be subject to the laws of motion, where you are going to stay in motion until acted on by an outside force. And you want that outside force to be the rope you're holding onto and not your face in the water. So you can't just ram into a ship and stand on the decking and be fine. So they need handholds. Uh, what else? Also, how are they boarding the next ship? Like, one of them does seem to be throwing a javelin, but this is questionable javelin range. Also, where are the Persian archers? I, there's so many questions about where the archers are. Also, the Persians seem to have shield stations on their decking, but the Greeks, de that's... There's a lot that's fishy with this. So, let's look at some better models. Here are our best guesses as to what is meant by some terms that we find in literary texts. Again, we run, run into the trouble of the literary texts assume you know what these words mean or that you've seen an ancient naval vessel or people operating on one, so they don't spend a lot of time explaining stuff that they assume is general knowledge but we no longer live in this world and we're missing a lot of detail. So uh, the important parts of this diagram are two and three. 
So two and three are demonstrating the backbone of a really good first maneuver in ancient naval combat uh, once we get to actual contact. So when you're at range from another ship, you are going to be sending out archer volleys. Eventually fire arrows become a thing. There's some debate as to when that starts to happen. That's useful because the rigging and the wood is impregnated with oil. It's very flammable. So if you can set the enemy ship on fire, they're going to have a hard time maneuvering and conquering you. And that's great for your side. So trying to set the other people on fire, high priority. And in some engagements in the ancient and pre-modern past, you do this by taking a couple junker ships that are on their last legs, setting them on fire, and then pushing them into the enemy fleet. That's a basic one. It's one of the oldest tricks in the book, but it still works, so, you know. But ranged weapons in this period are very limited. Other than handheld bows, you you don't have anything else. Artillery aren't going to be invented until the very late years of the Peloponnesian Wars, so we're not there yet. That's kind of next unit, and really the unit after that is when we're going to get into artillery. So big guns. There are no big guns here. There's just arrows. So if you want to do any damage at all, you need to make direct contact between your ship and the other ship without getting stuck and while doing the most damage possible. And here we need to think like the Titanic iceberg. We want to create as long a gash as possible, as disabling as possible, with as little damage to our own ship. So we don't want our outrigging to smash into the other ship's outrigging because then we'll damage our own ship. We don't want to get stuck. We do want to neutralize as many of their oars as possible, and we want to create as long a gash as possible in their side. So number two, we think this maneuver was a rake. We don't have a word for this. This is hypothetical, but very reasonable. Uh, this is a maneuver in which you don't make direct contact with the sides, so you go almost directly head on head when your line of ships is heading at the next line of ships. And these battles are laid out very much like land battles where you have a row of hoplites and a row of whatever infantry on the other side and they march at each other and then only we do it with ships. We have a row of ships and another row of ships and they sail towards each other and then action ensues. In this version, then, mostly you're going to be in the middle of the line looking at a ship almost directly across from you. So you sail in this game of uh, very risky chicken. And then at the very last minute, you tack. Oh, sorry, my that's my ring in the camera. That's not helpful. You tack to the side, you swerve, and you go close enough that you can whack off their oars, hoping that they don't pull their oars in at the last minute, which would be sensible. And you try to, like, just graze the side of your ship with your ram, their ship with your ram, rather, so that you can create instabilities in the decking. But you can't sideswipe them in a way that damages your own ship, and this limits the usefulness of the maneuver, which is why the question mark. This is a hypothetical maneuver, and we're not sure if it's a maneuver that you would choose to do. This might just be a very common, I don't know if mistake is the right word, uh, a common bad outcome. Like if you try to ram and you don't do it right, if the other ship manages to maneuver so that they get out of the range of your ram, you might end up accidentally doing one of these side swipey things. Much less hypothetical and much le much more useful, and indeed the backbone of ancient tactics, is the ramming maneuver. So here, you're still playing chicken, but you're coming at an oblique angle where the very corner of your ram, so that reinforced right angle on the edge of your ram, is 
hitting into the other ship and then skittering across its hull as the ship lurches away from the impact. And of course, this is assuming that the ship doesn't try to turn. So they're, you're going to be trying to ram them, but they're also going to be trying to ram... Uh, sorry, this guy's going to be trying to ram this guy. So you're you're both kind of coming at each other at the same time, and you're trying to make sure that you're swerving into the right ship. Therein lies the expertise and the tactics, and this is why you need to be rowing with your oars at this point in order to get speed, but also in order to have accuracy and in order to have that flinch, that all-important ingredient in a well-planned game of trireme chicken. Next, we have the advanced maneuver. Okay, we have a word for this maneuver, and we're still not quite sure exactly what's going on with this word, but here's our best guess. And this is a guess based on the way this word translates. This is the D ek plus. Plus is the Greek word for sailing, maneuver. Dia is like diagonal, um, a diaphragm goes across the bottom of your ribs. Dia. Ek is out, so like any kind of procedure that's an ectomy, like a, oh, I don't know, splenectomy, coleectomy is a gallbladder removal. Anytime you're cutting out an organ, cardiectomy, ooh, that's uh, ek. So D ek plus is the throughout sail. Okay, what is a through and then an out sailing? Here's the guess. When you are coming out of blockade, right, you've got somebody who's got a phalanx of ships lined up across a choke point, and you need to get through that blockade, then what you can do is instead of lining up with a bunch of ships horizontal to the ships like we just saw in the last diagram. Instead, you create a line of ships this way, so narrow and deep. The first ship goes in for a standard ram, so you ram this ship, skitter across. If you're lucky, you disengage and continue on your way. If you're not lucky, you just scuttle into the other ship and there you go. The person behind you, however, now has a gap to sail through here before the blue ships manage to smush themselves back together. So that's through, and you're sailing out of it, and then onto the other side. So a throughout sail. Okay, that, that makes sense. So maybe that's a diek plus. It's a word we have, and something military histor historians are still arguing about. It's really fun to watch them. So here is another useful tool in your arsenal. This is the peri plus, and this little paragraph makes this sound like we totally know what this is for. Uh, this is still just a guess, but it's a pretty good guess. I like the guess. That's why it's on here. And as the paragraph on the slide image reminds you this is part of how the battle of salamis was won so as the persians the persians are blue in this scenario come into the straits of salamis the athenians are able to come around that spit of land and create a ramming at the very end of the persian line well, technically the ionian line if we're going to be very precise about who's in those ships at this time so just the ship on the very end of the red team, actually, not just the, these two ships, I should have said, so red, sh red ship one and two, both come in ramming at the edge. Now, this may not look impressive now, but what they've done with this ram is they've knocked this ship sideways and if these ships are in tight formation, you knock this ship sideways, and then it knocks this ship sideways, and you have a domino effect all down the line, which is what that second ship is for, because the one ship can come in rake ram, and then the second one comes in rake ram. And you can continue to pound down the line and make the line roll up. 
This is borrowed straight out of the Hoplite Tactics playbook. If you can flank a Hoplite Phalanx and smush them too close together, they'll drift as they try to protect themselves in the shield wall and you can roll up the line. It's an alternative to breaking through at the center. Breaking through at the center is still the go-to tactic in this period, but when we get to the Macedonian Phalanx, they go in really hard for this kind of flanking tactic. For good reason. Flanking is a great idea. Try it sometime. Socially distant flanking, though. Here is another one. This is the Kuklos. This is also called the Hedgehog, and I'm going to ask you to remember Hedgehog because you've learned enough words for one unit. So the Hedgehog maneuver takes incredible precision, and if you think about it for a minute, you'll understand why. This is what it looks like. You have a group of warships all arranged in a circular formation with their sterns facing inwards and their prows facing outwards, and this is a 365 degree formation that allows you to sail outwards to attack anybody coming at you from any angle, or with these ships in the middle who are also facing outwards. So this way are the rams. They can sail between the spikes and the hedgehog and go out and like attack while the formation maintains integrity. So this is in essence like a, a combination shield wall offensive line. This was used at the Battle of Cape Artemision. So if you remember back to the first lecture in the series, while the Spartans and their allies were fighting the land battle at Thermopylae, the Athenians were maintaining a blockade at the entrance to the waters between Euboea and Greece, that Cape Artemision area. This is the formation they used for that blockade, and this was proof of their skill as mariners that they could stay in this formation. Because imagine, Okay, boats are floating on water that's constantly in flux. Water coming out of a strait is going to be creating riptides and undercurrents. And this is the Mediterranean, right? Tidal forces are an issue. So several times a day, the water is going to reverse directions and a storm could blow up, which is what ends up shutting this mess down. Eventually a storm blows up and the Athenians wreck because they're in this precarious formation, but you know, the Persians wreck too, so yay. And grudgingly, this is another thing 302 gets right. They're actually in, the, which means they did the research and they just didn't care, which is even more offensive. Oh my God, I hate that movie. Sorry, I really hate that movie. But this isn't nonsense. This is an actual formation. And if you're really good at sailing your trireme, I hope this works out for you. If you ever make this work, take pictures. I would like to see the results. I will totally give you extra credit if you successfully as execute a hedgehog, but not this year because social distancing doesn't allow you to create a hedgehog formation because your oarsmen are going to have to be too close. Like six feet apart is not going to work on a trireme. Sorry. And so I'm going to leave you with one last very silly artist rendition of ancient naval warfare. This is a really silly picture of the Battle of Salamis, where we do indeed have, let's see, let's check it off here. We have a T-boning trireme running right in through into our Ionians, which have round shields somehow. The the Greeks don't for reasons that are unclear to me. And then we have multiple Marines. I mean, it points to these folks who are not wearing excess armor. Yay. Where's their shield, though? They should have shields. They're moving in for a reasonable maneuver, though. So this is the end game. If your ship is stuck in another ship, you're locked into battle. This is the final stage where somehow, and in this case, they're doing it with a ladder thrown onto the enemy decking, which is fine. You send your Marines to jump from ship to ship, and then you turn a sea battle into a land battle. You continue to fight hand to hand like you would if a hoplite phalanx had broken. So you start still with javelins and spears, as these fellows are doing here. In fact, they've got a little mini phalanx going on, which is cute. 
And then here, where the fighting is thickest, you see Marines trying to board. In fact, I gave this fellow grief, but finally somebody put archers on the Persian ship, so yay, good for them. So it's not completely silly, but it, this... If you think about it for a hot minute, this does pretty effectively demonstrate the drawbacks of a T-bone impact maneuver. Yeah, it's great if you want to trade in your old ship for a new ship, uh, but it's a tricky proposition. If the ship that you ram starts sinking, it's going to pull your ship down by the heavy end first. The heavy end is your ram, so as this ship on um, blue is a horrible choice of color yellow any better yeah so as the ship begins to fill up with water this ship the one that's currently ramming it is going to get pulled down by the nose the keel might break you end up with a titanic situation and that's not great for anybody here which is why this kind of ramming is a last resort and marines fighting on decks are going to be a rare thing for a ship-on-ship -ship naval battle. Rather, they're going to be useful for amphibious result, uh, assaults, rather, assaults where a ship is coming up to land and then people are disembarking and continuing the fight on land. It's going to be useful in piracy, where you're one ship jumping another ship and you're trying to take it over real fast. But this isn't a great way to do boarding. And I bring this up because this is going to be an open problem in naval warfare that is going to be a key plot point when we move into the Punic Wars, that is the wars between Rome and Carthage, where Rome is going to try to troubleshoot this problem with mixed results. So stay tuned for future units. Enjoy the clips of the Olympias and have a lovely rest of your week. I will see you again next week when we enjoy the theater of war. Athenians writing plays where they deal with all of the baggage that this situation causes them. All right, folks. Take care. Stay classy. Have a lovely weekend. All my best to your families and catch you on the other side. Peace.